All right, here we are in part four of the relationship of walls to furnishings. My name is Steve Adamko. I'm the owner and founder of Spectrum Interiors, and that was established in 1982 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm now in Portage, Michigan, which is right next door to Kalamazoo. I mean, right next door as in butts up to it, okay? All right, let's continue on. Color schemes for the hall. The entrance hall is the first introduction visitors have to the home and is responsible for the first impressions gained. It ought to be decorated in warm, cheerful colors ordinarily and also to harmonize with the living room. So you could consider yellow tints or shades, tans, light browns, sometimes a dull rose, buff fawn, ivory, and cream are also very applicable to this room. And then you can go off and do something exotic as well, okay? But remember, we're kind of talking about generalities for the most part. We can go into, um, you can always veer off and do something unique and eclectic and out of the ordinary. But those are for special conditions and special times. And since I'm talking to large spectrum of people, I wanna keep it kind of middle of the road in a way even though that's not the kind of design I do. I don't do middle of the road average types of things. I do things that are unique expressly for unique individuals. All right, so here we go, continuing on. For large halls, fairly dark greens or dull red, um, browns are permissible, but they will certainly make a small hall appear to be still smaller. So the tents in small halls should be very light most of the time. So again, I'm talking about now for large halls, you can use darker colors and uh, richer colors as backdrops for other pieces of artwork that can give a very unique introduction to your house and kind of cause a little bit of excitement. And why not? It's the introduction to the home. All right, now for color schemes for children. A much better choice of decorations for a child's bedroom or nursery is more evident today than ever before, but there still is some tendency to force upon children color schemes which are appreciated more by grown-ups. A child's natural preference for colors tends toward bright and pure tones. It is possible to satisfy that preference without making a room too in intensely stimulating to grown-ups. When we attempt to force upon children a preference for quiet, subdued harmony very early in their lives, nothing is really gained by it. In the beginning, a child's preference is quite similar to the preferences of primitive peoples. When children are allowed to exercise their preference, at first they naturally become satiated with brilliant, pure colors and come naturally to a preference for true color harmony of grade tones later in life. The large surfaces such as walls and ceilings and floors in a child's room may be given grade subdued colors, but let there be considerable areas of the walls near the bottom which contain pictures or decorations done in pure bright complementary colors. The pure intense reds, orange, yellow, blue, green, and purple in moderate areas will satisfy and amuse the children without undue stimulation to mature people. The furniture of a child's room may be colored with the grade color hues, generally, but each piece of furniture should have its small area of pure bright color. The toys will naturally come in bright colors too. The bright colors and the grade colors of the furniture should, of course, harmonize with the wall, floor, ceiling, and wood trim colors. Okay, now we're gonna talk about large rooms or moderately large rooms. They offer greater latitude in the choice of colors, textures, and design than is possible in small rooms. Here, color schemes may be used which utilize greater contrast of values as between tints and shades of one color or as between light and dark colors. Also, colors may be used which constitute greater contrast of color hues of related colors or complementary colors. 
And here also colors are permissible, which show a greater contrast of intensity in pure, brilliant tone as between complementary colors and related colors. In other words, stronger, brighter colors, those which have been grayed or neutralized to a lesser degree by mixing in white or complementary colors may be used in large rooms. In moderately large rooms, the advancing colors may be effectively used, not in their brilliant tones, because that might produce too great a contrast of intensity. Contrast of color hue and contrast of values as well. But the advancing colors, which are orange, red, yellow, cream, and light tans, may be used in less grade or less neutralized degree. Pure intense tones of blues and greens are advancing colors as compared to grade tints and shades of blues and greens. As compared to pure intense reds, orange and yellow, the pure bright blues and greens are, of course, receding colors. Gloss and semi-gloss finishes may be used in large rooms but should not be used in small rooms since they apparently emphasize the limits of vision and appear to make a room smaller. Flat finish is best for small rooms and may also be used in large rooms. Now I will say that it depends on the situation. I've used a gloss or semi-gloss in a small room and it came out fabulously but again it has to be connected with what you're trying to achieve in a small room and it's knowing exactly what you want to achieve in the small room that makes a difference so again all these suggestions and or rules can be broken but only when you really know what you're doing otherwise you're just um, you're just going to fall flat some way or another. And I don't mean in the finish. You are going to fall flat in your ability to succeed pulling off some things if you don't really know what you're doing, which is obvious, isn't it? You know, if you don't know what you're doing, don't mess with it. Don't do it. Have somebody that knows what they're doing, do it. On the walls of large rooms, very rough textures in special wall finishes like Old English Holland, and Roman travertine are fitting, as are also stronger design in wallpaper, which contrasts to a greater degree in values and hues and intensities of colors than would be permitted in small rooms. A selection of color schemes for small rooms usually involves a consideration of ways and means to apparently increase the size of the room. Even when this is not especially desired, the designer or decorator must at least avoid a color treatment which will apparently shrink the size of a room. The walls of a room limit the vision. Colors on walls emphasize or minimize this limitation according to their own unique character. Generally speaking, the receding colors are the blues, greens, and the darker shades of other colors. Pure intense blues and greens are, however, receding colors only when compared to other pure intense colors like orange, reds, and yellows. Pure intense blues and greens are advancing colors compared to light tints and grade hues of blues and greens when used in large areas. Greens, blues, and blue grays, which can be used on large wall areas to give a receding atmosphere, are such as range from pale, pure tints of these colors to grade, neutralized dark shades like olive shades and old blues. When you reduce the intensity of these pure blues and greens by mixing white with them or neutralize them with their complementary colors, orange and red, you remove their insistent display strength. You make them as fully receding as possible with the consequent effect of apparently increasing the size of the room. By the use of strong advancing colors like yellows, orange, reds, and all tints, which can be used to express sunlight, the wall limitations are emphasized and made to appear near at hand. The room seems smaller with bright colors on the walls. Gloss colors are more advancing than flat colors. 
Now, again, sometimes gloss can add a sense of depth, actually seeing into and through the color. So again, it depends on each situation. To sum up then, the color schemes for small rooms and all decoration to give the effect of distance and recession should be composed of weak light patterns. If design is attempted on the walls in the form of wallpaper or as rough textures of special wall finishes, Patterns of rugs in small rooms ought to be small as well. Light in form and color contrasts of values, hue, and intensity, which should be low. In some rooms, perfectly smooth walls without texture are needed. Walls in small rooms should have a flat, not gloss finish, and the grayed blues and greens and cold grays are the colors to use for key colors. Self-tones and very closely related colors are especially useful in small rooms. Again, this is information that is, in the main, applicable. Okay, but again, there are situations where you can deviate from this and maybe should deviate from this. In other words, there could be conditions of the room and how much sun it gets or if there's a deep overhang on the roof or some other situation or a building next door that blocks light and other situations that would affect how that room looks and feels, then you've got to look at it in a totally different way. Now, that's something that you've got to do on site or somebody that really knows what they're doing can help you with that aspect um, due to the fact that there's going to be time, money, and expense in choosing a color or a treatment that doesn't work out, and then that time, money, and expense is wasted. So it's better to get some insight and some professional help with that in order to alleviate that situation from even happening. If the ceiling of a small room is low, increased height can be apparently given by the use of vertical stripes on wallpaper or stencil designs on the walls. These should be in self colors or very gray tints of related colors, having little contrast of values. Strong contrast of values hues, or intensity will make the wall advancing in color and apparently decrease the size of the room. Vertical panels using picture moldings will also apparently increase the height of low ceilings. A ceiling too high may be lowered apparently by the use of darker color on it, by lowering the picture molding to create a wide frieze at the top of the wall to be colored like the ceiling. Horizontal panels of picture moldings will also decrease the height of ceilings. And this is all visual, I don't want to say tricks, but they're visual ways that you can make the room appear to be like you want it to appear in a more ideal situation. All right, now we're going to be talking about rooms that have a northern exposure. All right, now we're going to be talking about rooms that have a northern exposure. Obviously, rooms on the north side of the residence receive no direct sunlight. And while they may be just as warm, in fact, I mean, temperature-wise, owing to the um, HVAC or the heating plant, they often seem cold and lack the cheer of rooms receiving the direct rays of the sun. This condition then offers an opportunity to the designer or decorator to add to the room a warm, cheerful atmosphere. Tints and shades of the warm colors red, yellow, orange, and warm brown are appropriate for this purpose. Tan, cream, ivory, old rose, warm gray, in other words it has red or yellow in its makeup, and green which is toned with red, orange, or yellow are appropriate as well. Often a wall color that is much too dull and cool for a north room can be brightened up materially by using quite strong warm colors in stencils. A fairly dark cobalt blue, for instance, on the upper side wall of a north exposure dining room may be effectively warmed up by stencils with tints of light brown, tan, buff, or cream. Okay, now for rooms with a southern exposure the aim in decorating such rooms is diametrically opposite from that for north exposures. 
The colors ought to be such as will modify the glare of direct sunlight and cause the rooms to appear cool or feel cool. The cold colors, blue, green, gray, violet, purple, and lavender are now most useful. The gray should not contain red or yellow, and the green should be one in which the blue, not yellow, predominates. In a room that is very light, the grays may be the most satisfactory. They do not fade so soon or as readily as greens, blues, and colors like that. Blue, green, and old blue made by, in a sense, tempering the blue with black are much preferred to either color in its full or pure state. In other words, it's a shade and not in its full intense state. Okay, now for light and dark rooms. When rooms to be decorated are lighter than average, extra care ought to be taken to avoid the use of pure intense colors and even bright but grayed colors in large areas. In such rooms, the bright light causes colors to display their brightness to the greatest extent. In light rooms, it is equally important to avoid great contrast of values, hues, and intensities of color. Also, strong patterns in wallpaper and all the other greatly contrasting designs. Useful colors in very light rooms are French gray, warm gray, pearl grays, olive, old blue, dull reds, and neutral greens. Dark rooms, on the other hand, may well be decorated in a rather colorful manner. Strong contrasts of value, hue, and intensity are permissible and are often urgently needed, especially are the sunshine colors such as yellow, red, and orange, including the tints of those colors. In dark rooms, too, the wall patterns and paper and stencil designs, as well as rough textures of special wall finishes, can be also more prominent. Colors used in dark rooms may be selected to add light to them. Yellow reflects more white light than any other color, so the yellows, cream, ivory, and light tans and buff are useful colors in dark rooms. Glaringly light rooms are made more restful by the selection of dull greens, grayed blues, and greenish or bluish grays. These colors absorb more light than they reflect. Deeper, darker, though neutralized, greens and blues may be used in rooms which are possessed of a strong natural light. Also, when it comes back to these paint finishes again, flat is flat. It does not reflect as much light. Where you get semi-gloss and gloss, they're going to be reflective of more light. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about ceilings and their colors. Now, in times past, the ceilings were given a lot of thought as to a very key component in the whole interior design, meaning the floors, walls, and ceilings were all considered as one unit or one whole. And this is done a lot in the French periods when there were ornate ceilings or vaulted ceilings or coffered ceilings and things of that nature. A lot of times in today's world, we don't give as much attention to the ceilings. So a lot of ceilings are thoughtlessly colored, plain white, ivory, or cream as a rule, giving an impression of a room without a roof, and meaning the walls seem to stand alone. It's said that these tints help reflect light, and they do in most rooms. And particularly if you're reflecting light off the ceilings uh, with torchers or indirect lighting, it's an important aspect. But a lot of times it's kind of of minor importance. In other words, there's not enough light that comes into the room that reflects off the ceiling. So a lot of times complete color harmony is often sacrificed by the indifference to the ceiling colors. So often on average jobs, the contrast of values between the ceiling and the walls is too great. The ceilings then are not a continuation of the harmony of the walls, trim, floor, and furnishings, Yet a ceiling is just as much a part of the room as all the other elements. 
So again, it's referring back to times when the whole environment, walls, ceilings, floors, were considered a whole environmental composition. A lot of times it's true that dark colors are not necessarily proper or in a sense permissible on ceilings unless they're unusually high and there's a wish to apparently lower them by decorative treatment. But more color can be carried to the ceilings without, in a sense, lowering them visually and greater unity in the harmony of the interiors is going to result. Related colors or complementary colors, much grayed and in light tints are quite often suitable as self tints to be used. For example, in a color scheme, the key color of which is brown with the climax color of rather pure intense orange and subordinate shades of grayed blues, a selection for ceiling color could be a light tint or grayed orange or a light grayed blue tint. Now, some of these colors that I'm speaking of right here, some of them are maybe applicable for today. Sometimes they're a little more applicable to period or historic interiors. But some people like to live in period type or historic interiors. They don't want to be just totally contemporary. But then again, these can also be contemporary as well, depending on how you use them. And when self tints are used, they may well be a bit more colorful since as a rule now, the contrast of values between ceiling and walls is too high or too great. So you wanna consider this in harmony or an orchestration or flow in values from the floor to the walls to the ceiling. So you can get darker on the ceilings and use other colors besides the typical colors that most people would use on ceilings. Now you don't wanna use colors of pure intensity on the ceilings because if you overdo it with strong contrasts of value, hue or intensity on the ceiling, it's gonna make the ceiling too prominent or too advancing. And so it's gonna put it out of balance as it were with the rest of the environment, meaning the walls and the floor. So it's a total balance kind of situation all the way around and from top to bottom. So you have to think of it as what it really is, a 3D environment. You're encapsulated by the floor, walls, and ceilings. It's not like you're in an environment with floors and walls and no ceiling in a sense. So it's still part of the decorative effect. And there are different ways that one can do that with color or architectural interest. All right, we're going to wrap up part four, and we're going to start part five with floor colors and designs. And I think that will probably be the last part of this series of the relationship of walls to furnishings.